Did you work for the money? Shut for those your earrings? mouth. Or did your daddy buy those? Shut up! The question I'm most often asked on this channel is, when are you going to do the Claire video? Analyze Claire, please. I really want to see your analysis on Claire. I hope you do your character analysis on Claire. I'm interested in what you have to say about her. I've been waiting for Claire. I am begging you to complete the series with Claire's video. Please do Claire. <laughs> well, we're here. Um, <laughs> but this is not the end of the series, by the way. I'm also 100% going to analyze Vern and possibly Carl. I may group both of them into one video. I'm not yet sure. So. This is not the end, it has been a while, <laughs> I know, longer than I'd intended. Thank you for still being interested, not forgetting and having that excitement. Um, I would apologise, but then again, balancing YouTube with a career as a counsellor isn't an easy thing and to be honest, I need the break from The Breakfast Club at times. If I watched that film every other week in order to make these videos, I would get sick of the film and I would not be drawing out as much because I wouldn't be as curious. Um, that's the same with any of my series really, I have to go at a pace I can manage, but we are here now for the character that, according to the poll I did the other week, the least of you relate to. Though Andrew is a close second and I have to wonder if part of that is because they were the blandest characters on the surface. They're also quite similar on the surface and I think the fact Claire does seem the least relatable, perhaps so much so I left her until last, says a lot about her as a person. Well the way we see her anyway, but we'll get to that. Welcome back to another character analysis. If you enjoy these videos, comment some other characters from other films worth analysing after this series is done because I'll need a new series. Um, maybe check out my therapy videos on Google Hunting or my therapy case study series about a girl called Katie if you're interested, but right now, let's jump straight in. Starting with something small I found quite interesting about Claire, which is a tendency for her to say things like I can't believe you can't get me out of this. Really a faintly sulky sort of disbelief, I can't believe this is my life right now attitude, which is interesting, in the sense it's quite a passive mindset, you know? It's as though life is dropping her in these situations, things happening to her, she's not an active participant. It's not that she's got herself into tension by breaking the rules, it's that her dad hasn't got her out of the tension. Life is this crazy, chaotic thing acting against her will, which obviously it can be, yet she is powerless to the point that all she can do is have a bit of a mope and a sulk. She was in a plane. Which I'm not saying negatively to criticise or anything, it's to highlight a sense of feeling powerless. Because she's the same in this group, Claire is the object of a lot of discussion, conversation happening to her, Bender bothering her, Andrew sticking up for her, both of them fighting over her, but for the most, she isn't directing anything. She's only really speaking in retaliation to others asking her things or talking to her about stuff. In the first group scene, for example, it's Bender throwing paper at her and asking if she's Andrew's girlfriend. Here it's Andrew asking if she'll come to a party and then asking why she won't. Here it's asking her if she... Want to see a picture of a guy with elephantitis of the nuts? Then the suggestion that Brian claims to have had sex with her. We get Alison pressing her about if she's a virgin or even when all of them are demonstrating their skills. It still takes Bender signalling I want to see what Claire can do before she speaks. In all of it, she's the object of discussion or subjects being talked to and brought into things, often things she'd rather avoid, but not exactly her own free participant, and powerless to drive the dialogue in any real way that suits her, which is an incredibly interesting paradox, because then the centre of attention, you're also quite invisible at the same time. Not to say there isn't power to this, and there is all those typical ways this sort of thing does get talked about, like um, a manipulation with her effortlessly dictating everything. There is some truth to that, because there is some power in being the centre of attention, of course. Um, and I think as someone who appears to fit that princess stereotype so easily, people do often look on it as a power to envy or sneer at, rather than seeing what in Claire's case is quite a hollow power. To be the object of discussion and attention without really having your space to express what you want, you're kind of trapped within the perception of others, seen constantly but not heard. 
objectified really, which of course leads us directly to Claire's home life and to what she describes of it to Andy when he asks if she's grounded because of detention. I don't know. My mom said I was, but my dad told me just to blow her off. I mean, I don't think either one of them gives a shit about me. It's like they use me just to get back at each other. Which of course is everything I've said in a nutshell. She's the object of discussion, the central subject. Claire's broken the rules and gotten herself detention on a Saturday. That should be quite a big deal. However, their interest is less in this or why Claire did it, but simply in using her detention as a means to fight for power between them. In this scenario, Claire's mum asserting that she's grounded and her dad undermining it to get back at her mum, promising to make it up to Claire, not so much because he wants a good relationship with his daughter, but because he wants his wife to be jealous and feel left out. I'll make it up to you. So again, she herself doesn't really have a voice. She's the topic of conversation, but not for her sake so much as her parents war with each other. And summed up further by a deleted scene where Claire acts out her home life, masking her dad behind a screen of paper to represent him. Hi, Dad. Hi, honey. I love you, my waltz in the dresser. All I can find of these deleted scenes are these badly filmed versions of YouTube where it is difficult to hear. So I think it's easier I just explain it and that this dramatization she does escalate into an argument between her parents about who's taking Claire on a trip with them and then who loves her more. Which is very difficult, I mean, what would you do then? Either you make a lot of noise to try and get noticed in place of this chaos and argument around her, or you'd just give up. You'd float along a little passively, without that voice, never quite in control of her life so much as blown about in the wind between her parents, dropped into situations against her will. She explains this dilemma with her mum saying she's grounded and her dad saying to ignore it. Well, because if I do what my mother tells me not to do, it's because my father says it's okay. So again, we see it's not doing what she wants to do. That doesn't come into it. It gets twisted instead into a question of which parent she sides with. Either she stays at home because she respects her mum's word or goes out because she listens to her dad. Both of which could ignite more conflict between her parents. So what can she do? You know, we know she doesn't want to side with one of them over the other because when Bender asks her who she'd pick out of the two, she avoids it by answering her brother. But she's forced into these kind of scenarios at home and it leaves her paralyzed. This is really happening to me. And the idea of being paralyzed between the expectations others place upon her is an interesting one when you get to the catch 22 about being a virgin. Well, if you say you haven't, you're a prude. If you say you have, you're a slut. It's a trap. You want to, but you can't. Then when you do, you wish you didn't, right? Which is, perhaps, partly by coincidence, a fittingly similar situation. Unable to express herself truthfully because she's caught between these two opposed expectations others place upon her. She's caught between the ways others perceive and objectify her, leaving her paralysed, unable to do much but try and avoid the question entirely. How stifling must that feel? Which again, she's objectified here more in a sexual sense, I suppose, as this prom queen figure to be judged either way as a prude or a slut. Seen solely as one of those two one-dimensional characters rather than as any ordinary person growing up with any ordinary difficulties around sexuality. So in that sense, it is quite a positive thing here that she can express the truth in the end. No! I never did it! Where the school society as a whole would probably judge her about that. It's a positive, um, relieving experience for her to find these group of people don't care either way. It's fine, you know? By the end, they've gotten to know her beyond just objectification. Also, in terms of this paralyzing position, um, it's a similar point, really, but the archetype of the princess as a whole, the social pressure she feels to be perfect, which is very similar to Andy having to fight and be this winner, this all-conquering racehorse, except that is something Andy can work at. He can train and get better. However, Claire is expected to be naturally perfect within herself. The beautiful, popular prom queen who never does anything she'd get laughed at for and never behaves weirdly or expresses anything outside of perfection. Whatever perfection is meant to be. <laughs> We have to be honest, that is a real pressure some people do feel in the school environment. The terror of having rumours spread about you, being laughed at, friends turning on you, which 
I think can particularly be the case for girls, um, particularly popular ones who are much more in that uh, social spotlight, I guess. And in Claire's case, constantly being objectified by others anyway, there's a point made in an interview by Molly Ringwald that Brian, for example, is free to be friends with Carl the janitor. You know, he has nothing to lose by befriending them. Because he's not in that spotlight to the same extent as Claire, who, in how she feels, lacks that freedom. Claire is terrified of losing her popularity, her image, and that power she does get as the object of attention. It is a hollow and unfulfilling power, yes, that traps her more than anything, but I guess there's a similar point I touched on in my Shawshank Redemption video. The more you do become trapped by something, the more you fear what you'd even be without that. The more Claire seeks perfection to mask, possibly feeling quite empty or unhappy with herself deep down, as we all feel at times and all have to struggle to face up to, the more terrifying the threat of losing that mask would feel, the more pressured you become to live up to it. The princess is Claire's image, she's unable to really express herself at home anyway, the only attention she does get is her dad's wallet for clothes and expensive handbags and um, <laughs> sushi and everything. Sushi? What other image does she have? Of course she feels she has to cling to this perfect princess image, she's not really sure who she is without it. It is an unfulfilling expression, but at least it's something. An object of attention is better than no attention at all, right? It's also useful because if you do feel lacking deep down, then this mask of popularity would bring some sense of superiority to defend you from those feelings. It's an approach like, if I don't feel happy with myself, then I can reinvent myself. But reinventing yourself as something you don't feel you can live up to leads you long term further away from feeling content with yourself, but she is given some status and power. Plus, you can project those feelings off into the less popular people seen to be below you. There's a defence there that appears to help. And this could be a stretch, I'm not actually sure what I think of this point, but you could say she has that same superiority with her parents. For example, in talking about her parents fighting and how they're heading towards divorce, something most kids would be quite anxious and worried about. She instead sounds very bored. It's a total drag. Like any minute, divorce. And so I'm just imagining it would be easier to float above the anxiety there. Leave the chaos of her parents fighting as something beneath her, where she can focus instead on um, her shopping and everything else. Not to be directly involved in this scary chaos, but to stay someone above it who simply has all that chaos placed around her against her will, if that makes sense. Either way, there is superiority in perceiving the Breakfast Club as for... Defective or anything. And that... I don't think I belong in here. I suppose part of maintaining your own perfection means highlighting the imperfections of everyone else. But there is a point I am vaguely wandering towards here, however. And it comes out of the fact there are these two ways of looking at Claire. It's that there is this side of her that would commonly get looked on in a very negative light. This side where the attention is some sense of power and she is quite superior and says stuff like I'm so popular, everybody loves me so much when she gets high or she's called conceited by Brian and YOU ARE A BITCH by Bender. There is this side of her that does appear very surface level and vain. Essentially, we can understand that she is trapped into this situation. She's not actually so shallow. No one is so shallow and empty deep down, nor is she a bitch really. She's nice to Alison with the makeover, which yeah, a lot of people don't like, but it's still Claire sharing one of her passions and interests with Alison. It's still a sense of kindness from her, and it's also nice she tells Brian it's okay to be a virgin, and it's nice we get to see her own insecurity around it, and we can understand a lot of depth behind her behaviour when I talk about it all like this, however, socially, she still doesn't quite get that same space for empathy as the others do. I mean, um, think about it, Claire never technically gets a moment to express her troubles the way everyone else does. Bender has his dramatisation of his home life and showing the cigarette burn, Andy has his Larry Lester monologue, Brian, though it does take him a while to carve out that space, has his flare gun monologue, Alison has her they ignore me moment. Where's Claire's in this film? 
It is there, but it's buried away in the conversation about if they'll be friends on Monday. Claire tells them she doesn't think they will be. She attempts here. This is her attempt to express that she feels trapped by the judgement of her friends and the social expectations of being perfect. She's trying to say she wants to be friends, but she feels stuck. This is her cry to say she doesn't know how to break away, and it makes her cry to feel so powerless. I hate it! I hate having to go along with everything my friends say! But it gets greeted with attacks of bitch and conceited, and even from Andrew... It's a real nice attitude, Claire. As though she was saying she doesn't value their friendship. Her attempt to express this prison of social expectations ends with not really being heard at all, but again, judged as this stereotype of a vain, shallow prom queen. It's a tragic moment precisely because of how under the radar it really goes. We do struggle to empathise here because it does sound conceited, and it sort of is, I'm not dismissing that. This whole image of perfection is an anxiety inducing lie that you'll stress yourself senseless chasing after, but it's also sort of a lie she'll have convinced herself with. I am a princess because a princess's life is one without flaw and tarnish. If I pretend mine don't exist, maybe they just won't. Maybe I'll be okay. When of course, the further back we push these feelings, the more we grow to fear them, and the more power over us they gain. It's tragic Claire isn't heard here, and that of course fuels the image even more. To see her further as vain and conceited, she mentions being under pressure, and it does open the way for Brian to express his situation, which is very positive, but we never come back to Claire at all. Bender describes her as Rapunzel in this film. Fucking Rapunzel, right? It's fitting. Living in this grand, decadent tower with all manner of luxuries, and yet, it's a prison. One where she's so high up and far away from the rest of the worlds that we do struggle to empathise. You got everything, and I got shit. Bender is right, he's justified to feel some anger there, and yet, is it fair on her to not fully connect with her struggles because she is Miss Popular Prom Queen? It took a very caring moment from Andrew to break through Alison's defences, but Bender simply doesn't do that for her here. He attacks her. Is she without growth then? Not at all. Sometimes I think great poetic moments of breakthrough are overrated. Sometimes it's more about offering small experiences of a different way of living for people to internalise over a gradual period of time. And I think Claire is much less superior by the end of the film. Evidenced in her closeness to a group of people she originally protested that she didn't belong with. All their weirdness or outsiderness isn't just something to turn her nose up at, but something with value, because Brian, Alison and Bender are all free in ways she is not. And I think she recognises and values that by the end, even if she still struggles, and to be fair, Miss Perfect is smoking weed and expressing some more rebellious, troublemaking side of herself too. Excuse me sir, why would anybody want to steal a screw? <laughs> that noise? Was that the noise you were talking about? No, it wasn't. As Bender puts it, Being bad feels pretty good. And bringing herself back down to all this chaos rather than floating passively above it all as something that she's not meant to be touched by, that helps her find some agency and individualism. By the end, Claire is far from sulky and passive. She's not only quite upbeat and enjoying their company rather than resisting it, but she's also become a much more active presence. Seeing best where she has this leader-like moment of asking Brian to write a group paper, taking Alison away for a makeover, and then consciously choosing to go off to Bender's room and to kiss him. Regardless of whatever we might think about those choices, she is actually making some here, she's finding some authority finally. You know, sure they're only subtle changes, but they're symbolic, and they're an experience that proves in a very concrete way to herself you can have a voice, you can have some power over your life. What if you don't have to remain paralysed in this objectified state of the princess, the prom queen, the trophy? What if Rapunzel can let her hair down out the window and escape? You know, you don't want a kid to grow up feeling paralysed by expectations. I can only imagine how much anxiety must come with that nor how particularly painful that period in ageing everybody hits where they look back and think, is this what I wanted from my life, am I happy with the path I took? 
how much more of a hammer blow that would be if you have carried on out into your 30s or whatever just floating along on a sort of life you're expected to live not really considering if it's what you do really want. I mean everybody has those doubts with life, they're natural, but they'd be particularly hard for her if she never did find her voice or sense of individualism. But shall we talk about her relationship with Bender now, because it is problematic and complex. Bender is a very complex character and he does have a positive impact on Claire, he is part of what helps her find this agency and Whilst to say he didn't offer empathy like Andrew did for Alison, he has still accepted her by the end, which is kind of what Claire really needs, acceptance. Hopefully enough of it that she can learn to accept herself. Also even just symbolically, I think we can be aware this uptight, trapped perfection of Claire could do with some of this chaos and imperfection and just fire, that's all true. However, it's also true, he consistently humiliates, attacks and sexually harasses Claire. All his own volatile feelings and fears of rejection come at her in a wave of anger and dominance that is very uncomfortable to watch in many places. And we can think the relationship they might have together following this wouldn't be a healthy one. That's not set in stone. Bender does have good growth and we can hold some hope. However, if he's shouting at her the way he is now and making her cry and things... I hate you! Yeah? Good! Then it's entirely possible things would only get worse and more abusive with time. It's not inevitable, but it is possible. And, you know, the morality or um, the message of the film is one people do question here, and they are right to. A bloke who sexually harasses and treats Claire like shit still wins her by the end of the film, and what could very easily be an abusive relationship is framed very romantically. People are definitely right to question that, which it's important I do say, and Molly Ringwald who plays Claire in this film even wrote an interesting article about it worth reading that I'll link in the description. However, the focus of this video is more on understanding the character's behaviour and feelings, so we have to look at it as though they are real people. And so with that in mind, the first obvious question is that, is it realistic Claire would do that, fall for Bender after all he's put her through? Well, I think the fact it's the 80s does make some small difference, however we do also know for some people there are many situations, particularly so with teenagers who are still figuring out what the hell relationships are and what having a partner is like, there are situations where they do fall for people that treat them like dirt, we know that. It's not good, it's a bit weird framing it as romantic and sunny at the end, but it does happen. But thinking about what attracts Claire to Bender, part of that would of course be the thrill of something more volatile, it can appear attractive, particularly when you're young. and. Uh, some of that volatile chaos is a positive contrast to her passivity. Even if Bender would probably bring very dangerous levels of it, she does need to find some more of that in herself. You know, often anger and rebellion in kids is seen as wholly a bad thing, which it can be, but kids also need some of that as part of finding their voice, the chaotic explosions hopefully start to level out into more rounded expression with time. And it's also about autonomy, how can you grow up free to think with your own autonomy and power over yourself if you never do fight against the world or your parents or whatever it is at some point. I think you do need to have those experiences, hopefully in some safe and more healthy ways. Which on that point, Bender would serve for Claire as one huge middle finger to her parents. As much as they do ignore her, they sure as hell sit up and take notice when she brings a kid like Bender home as her boyfriend, you know? Wouldn't I be outstanding in that capacity? And that would, on some level, feel like a satisfying revenge for Claire. Not a fulfilling one, but definitely a satisfying one. And then also, what happens on Monday? If they are dating now, if Bender has dared to care for Claire, a bit more than her being another one of the girls from his photo album, and if they do walk down the hallway together on Monday, rumours would spread. It could technically be Claire's worst nightmare, and it would genuinely be a very painful experience. Rich prom queen dates poor low-life criminal or whatever. If she could navigate that difficult experience in school though, and all the rumours and everything, there is 
something quite liberating there because it is independence from her friends and from going along with everything they say and think. Scary as that is, it may also be appealing. So I guess in general as well, Bender kind of represents a big middle finger to everything that has her stifled and feeling trapped. None of that, however, touches on the sexual harassment itself at all. No, Claire doesn't fall for Bender because of it. The argument that she likes the harassment is just wrong. Um, we clearly see she doesn't in her reaction. I think if you interpret her as liking it, it is worth just taking a moment to imagine this scenario, not just the fantasy of it, but the reality, to um, really consider that. Claire has been finding him a little attractive long before this moment. I think we first spot it in this film when Brian's babbling on about how his cousin got high and felt like he didn't belong anywhere, to which Claire turns to Bender and says, Sounds like you. And perhaps we can read into that as her finding some appeal in the idea of not belonging, not having to fit in. But we notice more later on here, Mole really pumps my nads. Oh yeah. Music kicks in the background to reinforce this idea, so she's sort of attracted to him, only it's quite complex and he's pretty horrible at times, but he says he's trying to help her and to be honest, so it's confusing and then this happens. To feel violated in a shock moment, probably to feel powerless, weak, shamed for not being able to stop it. Guilty as though it was somehow your fault, compounded by the way Bender dismisses your anger with amusement. Sue me. To feel exposed and embarrassed and paralysed. You've already felt paralysed half your life, being invisible at the centre of attention, and then this feels like that times a thousand, the very object of attention. And then nobody else seems to care or bat an eyelid either, so are you meant to just accept that it happens and move on like it's nothing? Maybe it is nothing. I mean, you're 16, what do you know? Sex is something you like the idea of, but you're also hesitant about, so what do you know? Maybe you were supposed to enjoy it. So now you feel stupid for not enjoying it, and for feeling hurt and angry, or maybe you feel stupid for being attracted to Bender to begin with. Maybe then it is your fault. Did you cause this by sending mixed signals? And now you're shaming yourself even more, and your head is spinning with a ton of different emotions at once. Anger, guilt, shame, embarrassment, confusion, all for something that's not your fault at all. It's the actions of someone else without much care or empathy for your feelings. Um, for me, I see Bender's actions here as a lack of empathy and basic understanding, but also born out of his own inner struggles with rejection for whatever reasons we don't know to do with his past. Rejections either from or projected onto women with this wave of anger for their perceived rejection, so he then both gets even as he sees it and takes by force, probably also wrapped up in some of his anger at Claire for being so pristine and good and rich. I know that's simplifying it a bit, I should also point out that all of that interpretation is me just trying to understand an event beyond my own knowledge, so I could be wrong and I welcome other thoughts in the comments. That's just my interpretation going off what I have read in the past off a much smaller experience I had in school being sexually harassed by someone and just trying to sit and imagine the scenario for Claire. And I forgot to say at the beginning as a disclaimer, but it's true in general, all of this is just my interpretation, it's not necessarily correct. It is important we do try and empathise with things beyond our knowledge though. Often that means we don't quite hit the mark, but it's important we try, and that's important in growing our understanding and connecting more with difference. We've talked about all five kids from the Breakfast Club now. We've still got definitely Vernon, possibly Carl to go. There's a lot with this series I've missed out as well, particularly in Alison's video because that was the first, so I don't know if I'll do something going back or some kind of wrap up. Either way, there's more to come. Um, to try and offer some conclusion about Claire though, she does have good growth for what is just one day at school, yes. Um, and it is just one experience in a group unlike her usual friendship group, but we do internalise these experiences. We absorb them, and they often come to affect us some way and somehow down the line, if not immediately. And in a cinematic sense, Claire's character arc takes her from sulky and passive and a bit aloof to someone upbeat, 
more down to earth and with some authority by the end of the film. Would I feel concern about her relationship with Bender? Yes, it could turn abusive if that was something she got trapped into and that would definitely be a terrible thing. However, I do also have hope. I think um, it's important she actively chose to go with Bender entering into that room, her initiating the kiss, and we see her able to set some level of boundary here, so I'm hoping their relationship isn't anything worse. This is all technically part of many experiences growing up, like I say, still figuring out what the hell relationships are. Perhaps things would go well with Bender, perhaps they wouldn't, but there'll still be things to learn from the experience and take forwards, even if it requires a long time to process them. Um, we shouldn't imagine because of the movie ending that way that these relationships would hold true forever. They might not even last a day. We don't know. That's life. Um, or it would be if this was real. <laughs> That's the conclusion of this movie as well, isn't it? Um, nobody's problems are solved. They've all still got to go back to their families and struggle on, but hopefully they'll take something positive from the experience of The Breakfast Club internally, and that will hopefully make navigating those struggles at home and of growing up in general a little bit easier or safer. That is all I have to say though, um, let me know what you think, like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe, support me on Patreon if you want, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. As ever, a special thank you goes to Devin, Darren Brother Glatter, Kestrel, Arwen, Stephen Lake, Janice McMahon, Samara Salsi, Sharakov2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, and Incomplete Sentence. Thank you.